This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, by I'm told, a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Playcast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joel. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay. Here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. All right, 141 episodes in. Thanks for clicking subscribe, stream, download, listening to this podcast. It's Play by Playcast, the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster, a professional development podcast that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, process, stories, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play by play announcers in the business. My name is Joel Godet. I'm the radio and television voice at Ball State University. You can follow me on social media at Joel Godet. Just remember you followed me um, at Joel Godet. And you can find the uh, podcast at PXPCast. Reminder to always rate and review the podcast as well. Really appreciate it. I'm told it helps. Um, and I am proud to say that we are the most reviewed and rated and high, highest rated um, podcast in our niche or niche. Or as Eric Matthews and Boy Meets World would call it, niche um, so thank you guys for the support, um, continued over the last two and a half, almost three years of this podcast now. Um, I don't know what day, I, I do know what day it is because this podcast is coming out. Beyond that, I don't know what day it is. It's about to get real, people. I am half fired up, half terrified. Uh, <laughs> as you're listening to this podcast, I am likely in the car on my way to Ypsilanti, Michigan, to broadcast Eastern Michigan, Michigan State Gymnastics tonight. Tomorrow, I'm then driving to Kalamazoo, Michigan, to broadcast Ball State men's basketball at Western Michigan. I'm then promptly driving to O'Hare to fly to Dallas to do Wichita SMU, which I found out I'm doing like three hours ago. I don't know anything about either team. Um, This will be great. All in good time. Uh, That's on Sunday at 1, 2 Eastern as if that buys me time. Uh, (laughs) Then Monday, I'm doing UCF at Houston women's basketball. Then Tuesday, I've got Ball State again. They're at Eastern Michigan. So I guess my week comes in full. Wednesday is off. Thursday, I fly to Pittsburgh, where I do the A-10 quarterfinals for the women. Then the next day, I do the A-10 semis for the women. Sunday, off. Monday, Mid-American Conference Tournament first round. Tuesday, fly to Vegas. Wednesday night, Mountain West Championship on CBS Sports Network. Red Eye to Cleveland to do the MAC tournament for Ball State, hopefully the next day and the next day. And then that gets us to Saturday, where we'll I have the Mid-American Conference Championship for the women on CBS Sports Network. And you would think that is where it ends. You would be wrong because then Sunday is off. Monday, I don't know. Tuesday, Ball State Baseball on television, which will be fun because I've never done baseball on TV, as we will learn over the next couple of podcasts. Wednesday, baseball on radio for Ball State. Thursday, volleyball, men's, Ball State, ESPN3. Friday, something. Um, I haven't looked at a calendar. Saturday, uh, gymnastics on Big Ten Network. Sunday, gymnastics on Big Ten Network. Monday, I don't know, but I think it's April. That's my next three weeks. I'm not complaining because, like, that's awesome. Like, a lot of people would kill to do that. It might also kill me. So if you want it, uh, there might be an opening in April because I might be dead. Lack of sleep deprivation. I'm also doing the CrossFit Open. Not that I'm going to do it well or any good at it, but I am doing the intramural open, and I have a teammate at my box, so he's relying on my score, which means sometime during all that span, I have to do the prescribed workout over the weekends somewhere at a box. <laughs> anyway, Ted Leitner is our guest this week. Uh, his season, he's in crossover season right now. He's the voice of the San Diego State Aztecs basketball and football teams. He's also the voice of the San Diego Padres. So he's in spring training right now. Nothing big has happened with his team. They haven't spent a lot of money at all in the last week. We actually were going to record this podcast last week. I mentioned it at the end of the episode last week with Jason Horwitz. Uh, And Ted had to cancel on me last second because he wasn't allowed to do media until Manny Machado officially signed. 
Uh, luckily, Manny Machado officially signed, and we did the podcast uh, this week. So Ted Leitner is our uh, guest on the pod. Literally four decades, 40 years this year, as the voice of the San Diego Padres, 78 to 2002. He was also uh, a television personality on KFMB in San Diego. Um, he'll talk about his unique style from television. He's done TV in a handful of different markets. He's done play-by-play for a bunch of teams, uh, Eagles, Clippers, Chargers, uh, Oklahoma. Went to college to play football, wound up being the radio guy. He's an awesome guy, phenomenal storyteller, great personality, uh, and he can really spin it, which you will learn over the course of the next hour. Ted Leitner is our guest here on PXP Cast, the voice of the San Diego Padres, and we talk about those beginnings on his way to Oklahoma State. <laughs> my, standard, my standard answer for that is on a Greyhound bus. That's how I wound up at Oklahoma State, <laughs> which is actually the truth. The actually the truth from Port Authority in New York City, making 97 stops or whatever it was in every little town and burg and village and what hamlet. It was amazing. 39 hours and uh, got to Tulsa and then had to wait and take a bus to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State. And then, honestly, I was going to walk on and play football, and my brother had gone there, not to play football, but to major in phys ed, my oldest brother of two. And he said, it's a great place, friendly people, beautiful campus, and uh, not too brutal in winter, though it can be. And he was gone in the summer. So with that, I thought, okay, look, it's, it's I'm, in, I'm in New York. I don't have great grades. I can't afford the New York good schools, and I can't get into the good schools. So it was even then, it was $18 a credit hour for out of state back in 1965 at Oklahoma State. And after that, I can take a student loan, I can do that. And that's how I wind up in the long answer at uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma. You do all of that to go play football. And then, like, I, I was watching another interview where you basically just said, the, the opportunity to do football on the radio was presented to you, and it, it seemed like an easy decision. How did you make that jump that quickly? Yeah, I did. I went and I talked with the president of the professor of the radio television department uh, before it became radio television film, which I think it is now, in the communications building. And I said, look, I'm majoring in, in, in broadcasting or radio TV. And, uh, and he said, what do you want to do? I said, I'd, I'd love to do play-by-play and anything else in broadcasting. And, and they were very, they were great because they were not – broadcast slash announcer oriented they were sales management oriented and they would tell you hey do all the broadcasting you want there's the campus radio station there's the campus fm and uh do all you want but in the meantime you're going to take business law you're going to take broadcast law you're going to take all sorts of stuff in addition to we're not teaching announcing here you go on your own and, and become a broadcaster but we're interested in, in teaching people into sales and management and that's where management comes from from sales and so that's what their orientation was, which was so smart because everybody wants to be the next Jack Buck or, or Kurt Gowdy, and you're not going to be. You know, it's like telling young athletes, you're, you're really good, but you're not making the NBA. Mm. You're not making the NFL. You better do something else. And uh, Professor Bob Lacey, who was wonderful, former country singer, uh, as Greg Martin, and his real name was Bob Lacey, and uh, I miss him. He did so much for my, my career in steering me the right way, and he was just like one of the guys tremendous communicator with his students and that's what he told me to do so he said at the same time how good a football player are you i said well i'm walking on i have no scholarship that ought to tell you right there and he said well if you're not that good you want to be a broadcaster you don't want to be a professional football player do this the the guy and steve o'neill who's the play-by-play guy for the last three years he's a senior so go work with him and when he goes i'll make you the sports director of the campus radio station i said deal done done and in the back of my mind i'm also thinking phil cutchin is the head football coach at oklahoma state he grew up in uh, under bear bryant you know who used to just kill his players Mm. kill his players so i talked to my roommate who was a football player from tulsa and i said what do you think and he said what what should i do he said hey we practiced today and phil didn't didn't bury it he killed us but for a change he didn't bury us that's what every practice is like this guy thinks he's bear bryant he's not and he doesn't have a Bear Bryant team. And I thought, okay, I made the right decision. And I really looked back and really made the right decision. You were a TV guy, though, first professionally, right? No, I started with radio. I started with radio and, and, uh, and, and just kind of in very, very small increments. But the first job, yes, that happened to come up was the weekend job at the uh, CBS TV affiliate in Oklahoma City at KWTV Channel 9. And uh, I don't re- even remember how I got into audition for them. 
I, honestly, I, 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 never, I haven't thought of it in, in 40 years, and I really can't remember how that happened. But I went and I auditioned, and Jack Solaska, uh, rest in peace, and thank you, Jack, he chose me to do the weekends there at Channel 9. And uh, I, I was just, you know, right after graduation. I mean, who gets jobs like that? I look back and think, my God, who was I to fall into these things? And then one would fall, another domino would fall, and it would lead to this and lead to that and, and go from television to television and the Sooner Football and Basketball Network. And uh, gee whiz, it just one thing after the other. And I don't know how it happened, but I'm sure glad it happened. For someone who never watched you as a television sportscaster, um, how would you describe to them the style that you – um, performed in, the style that you worked in? It's interesting because when I started, they didn't have teleprompter, and I did not want to do that, you know, head down on the copy, up, down, up, down, up, down. As a viewer, I didn't like it. It made me nervous and, and uncomfortable, so I decided, okay, I'll, I'll write the script and in the pre-teleprompter days, and then I won't use it. I'll memorize the entire thing. And I do have a, a way, I'm not photo, it's not photographic, but I do have a, a good memory to do that to this day in terms of memorizing all, all the wide receivers, all the running backs, the entire defense, everything except the offensive line. And, and no, when I see a number, I think of the name, and I don't use a spotter in, in football play-by-play. So hmm. I just haven't, I've been able to do that for a long time. But then I started just looking right at the camera and memorizing most of it. And, and, and throwing in an ad lib here and an ad lib there when I got comfortable, because I was not comfortable <laughs> when I saw, when I started. I must have been so bad and, and uncomfortable and stiff, but I, it just, you know, you loosen up, you loosen up. I tell you, I, in grade school, junior high and high school, when it came time to do an oral report, they would either go up the rows or alphabetical. I cut school every single time. And with my father, that was living dangerously. <laughs> you know, when he found out, I cussed really the age of living dangerously back in the old days uh, when they would, you know, kids would get the crap beat out of them. So I, it was worth it. It was worth it. I ain't, I'm not getting up there in front of these 15 kids, my peers and talk. And that's not unusual. You know, that's that's they always do those research polls. And then people in their fears, sometimes like Seinfeld says, you know, the fear of public speaking in these research polls are greater than the fear of death. So like, like Seinfeld says, they'd rather actually be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. And I thought, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. And I would do that. And to this day, I will stand at Petco Park with 40,000 people. I'm at home plate as the master of ceremonies for whatever ceremony. And before I start, I take a deep breath and I look around at the upper deck and all the people and think, what the hell are you doing here? And how did this happen? How did this happen? Because I love it now so much, and I've done it in front of 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 uh, banquets and luncheons, you know, with a 1,000, and just no nerves, can't wait to do it. And I ad lib those things for the most part as a guest speaker and, you know, go by the, by the outline for MC job. But I, it's, I try to tell this to young groups all the time. Don't tell me you can't do it because if I did it, by God, you can do it. And that's really the way it's turned out. I've been so incredibly lucky. How'd you get there? How did you go from – not wanting how would you go from wanting to be in the coffin to at least having the not not wanting to give the eulogy but the the guts to do it you know i think when you finally realize there is no consequence the the, the only the only way that you screw those things up is when you're stiff and you make a mistake and you see you see people do that or hear people do that and it gets worse as they stumble and that, 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 no no uh, i'm trying to spit it out it's worse. if you're totally relaxed and and again you're ad living like with the televisions that I, that I did for for how many years. I ad lib all that all those television shows at the, on the nightly sports at six and eleven, and then six and ten, I guess in Oklahoma City, and uh, it, in doing so, you have to get to the point that really, if you're relaxed, you can't make a mistake. It's the Johnny Carson syndrome, I call it, where he would go out there and and do a joke and he'd bomb, and then his reaction to the bombing was funny hmm. he do that because he studied jack benny and then when jack benny went from radio to television and benny had that look of well this audience doesn't know what they're doing or i don't know what the hell i'm talking about and he got such a great reaction that you can't then make a mistake there's no consequence so so you're when you're relaxing you say and uh, sooners did oh did, did i say sooners 
no, I meant cowboys, and move on, and there is no mistake because you relax and you pick it up. And I was able to start doing that as I gained confidence and did it for the next uh, 40 years in, in television sports. I love the quote that you had. Uh, you talked about when you worked in – it wasn't when you worked in Philadelphia. It was after that. It was when you worked in San Diego. Um, either your news director or, your, or, or someone at the station came up to you and said, you know, hey, go out there and piss them off today. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, tell me about that mentality and, and how that plays and, and, and what's good and or bad about that and why it works. It Again, and I did not do that. I never, ever intended to do that. I intended <laughs> to want to look. I, yeah, I intended to want to look them right in the eye in the camera. You know, occasionally break contact, look down for just a second to break contact so you're not staring right at them. Because a guy I know who became a friend of mine later, when I was in college, uh, Ross Porter was the anchor for the NBC facility in Oklahoma City. And I would rush, watch Ross, and Ross did the same thing as I did. He memorized everything. They didn't have teleprompters. But he would look at the camera and never break contact. And it really started to make people go nuts. That one time a fly was buzzing around his head, and people at the home would later tell him I was saying, yelling at him, shoot that fly! Shoot that fly! Move! Do something! Show that, you're, show that you're alive but he would lock into that camera and i was trying not to do that and ross became the longtime uh radio guy with the dodgers working with vin scully and those guys and uh so i got that that i wanted to do that like ross but i would you know break contact a little bit look down or look off camera for a second and come back and, and make it very relaxed and so i started doing that but then as i started going into full ad lib mode i would throw in comments and, and alleged alleged humor and stuff like that and it kind of took off and uh, adding commentaries, pretty serious commentaries and stuff like that. When I thought it was a good idea was when I was in Hartford for Post Newsweek and they did marketing research. And then the news director told me, you know, they, they keep hearing this when they ask people about you, that uh, it looks like he's talking right to me. <laughs> and, and of course, in that day and age without teleprompters, people were doing that, you know, down, copy up, copy up, copy up. And I was the only one they'd ever seen that was looking right at them, in news at least. And they would make that comment. You know, they like them. They don't like him, whatever. I like sports. I don't like sports. I know sports. I don't like sports. I don't know sports. But he seems to be talking to me. I really like that. And other non-sports fans would then tell him when I would do other stupid stuff and make comments that it was entertaining, even though they knew nothing about sports. And then I thought, hey. By accident, I think I'm onto something here, and that's what I started doing with kind of a Howard Cosell you know, presentation of commentary and knocking athletes and showing bloopers and guys making stupid mistakes and, and calling them stupid. And it just got really, really big in uh, Hartford, and then it got even bigger in, in, in San Diego. I was very, very lucky. I'll leave that thread uh, untied. I want to come back and pull on it a bit in a second, um, but I want sure. to jump real quick to – when play-by-play -play professionally came into the picture for you um, on a consistent level was when? The, at, uh, in grad school, right after grad school at Oklahoma, after going from Oklahoma State, went to grad school for a year in Norman. I didn't have any intention to do that. But one of the other professors, Jack Deskin, who was a good friend of mine uh, and professor at the same time, it's a difficult you know, tightrope to walk, but he walked it like the professor Bob Lacey did very well. And they could literally be friends with some of the students and, and they were wonderful. And, uh, and Jack said, no, you know, you, you never know. You don't like sales. So you're not going to be in sales. You're not going to get to management without sales. So in case this, this on the air thing doesn't happen, get, get a master's and then you could teach. I said, Jack, I don't want to do it, do it. Listen to me. And I listened when Jack talked. So I went to OU for a year, Oklahoma university for a year doing grad school. At, and uh, that you know kept me there and got me contacts. Like I said, in, in Oklahoma city, for television and radio and that's uh when the radio that's when the, the uh the television started with that the weekend job and then the other stuff kind of came along i think because of the television and I, that was a very fortunate hook in there because i never gave up on i didn't i never loved tv sports at, not certainly not at that time but i wasn't very good at it i think early on and I, I loved it later when it was just so easy and and, and having fun and whatever and uh that sort of thing but the play-by-play -play came full-time right after grad school when uh, they called me and the Oklahoma University play-by-play -play job for football and basketball was open and the color commentary job was open because they had changed stations after a gazillion years. And they called me to my TV work in, in Oklahoma City on weekends and said, would you like to do the uh, color for the uh, football? 
And the guy doing it doesn't want to do basketball, so you can do the play-by-play on the basketball. So to answer your question in less than 17 minutes, <laughs> that started that started in 72 in Oklahoma right after grad school. What did you find fulfilling about that that you didn't find in television early on? The uh, From the standpoint of play-by-play? Yeah. What did you like about play-by-play early? I just... It's just, I, I, I loved it from the very first game I ever did. And, and that was on the campus radio station in 65. Oklahoma State played in Arkansas. So they did all the home games and they took one road trip a year. And this happened to be the War Memorial Stadium in Little Rock. And you have to understand, Stanchel, I talked like this. You know what I mean? I was from New York City with the, with the thickest New York accent you've ever heard in your life. And, but they didn't care, which was terrific of them. And uh, so I went with the aforementioned Steve O'Neill, and we split the game. I had never seen a college football game in person, ever, ever. We had no money. We didn't go to games. And back east, you know, who was I going to go to? Columbia and watch watch their games. I'd never seen a pro game or a college game in person, and that was the first game I ever did play-by-play on. So when I came back, Professor Lacey called me and said, you know, you're pretty good for having never done it before. And I said, well, Bob, quite frankly, I was doing a lot of copying of Marty Glickman, who I listened to, who did the New York Giants when I was a kid in New York. And so I kind of leaned on his stuff. That's fine. He said, that's fine. You can, you can steal stuff and then develop your own style as, as you go along. But I, I got to ask you this. Since the game was a Little Rock, tell me, where exactly is Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, you mean the New York accent? Yes. Uh, here's the wall and sack tape recorder, he said. I want you to practice getting rid of that, listen to yourself, look in the mirror, listen to yourself and do this for about a gazillion hours a week until I don't hear a New York accent. And I did slips out every once in a while, but he said, you're not going to get a job. Not even in New York. I don't think you're going to get a job with that accent, (laughs) even for New Yorkers. And so I started doing that and it was wonderful because the next game they thought, Hey, we've got budget. Let's do another game because it's the Astrodome. And this was when it first opened in 65, you know, with that Yankee Astro uh, Mickey Mantle, all that stuff, uh, who hits the home run. And they had the first exhibition game. That was it. The Yankees and Astros in the Astrodome. And they said, hey, they just opened this place. Let's let's get the budget. Let's go do it on the campus radio station. So I get to go to the Astrodome. It's just absolutely outstanding. Later on, I find out that the Stillwater radio station, KSBI, was knocked off the air during the broadcast. So people tuned over to the campus radio station and heard me and were calling in and saying they liked me. And I thought, gee, this is wonderful. What a great opportunity that this happened, that they get knocked off and people listen to me. And that gave me, I think, tremendous confidence to get away from Marty Glickman, though he was terrific, and, and start to develop my own style. What was great about Marty Glickman? Um, and, and what did you take from him back when you were a kid? Hey, I'll tell you what. Marty Glickman has been a forgotten guy in the industry, but not in New York. Mm. Ask, ask, ask Marv Albert, because Marv used to work mm. with him. And, and Marv will tell you, this guy, hey, this guy invented uh, NBA play-by-play. He invented basketball play-by-play. And it, what we call today, you know, the key at the top of the key and the lane and all that stuff before they called, you know, called it the paint. But we called it the lane. Marty invented all that. And he, he just was an amazing trailblazer in, in basketball and a terrific football play-by-play guy with the Giants at a time when, you know, they're very successful. They've got Frank Gifford and Y.A. Tittle and all those guys and that great defense with Sam Huff and those people. And so he became very popular, A, because they were winning, and B, because he was very good. And his own, he was an Olympic athlete, as you know, and, and then moved into it. He was really, really good at it. And I was so glad because I did an exhibition game between the Eagles and the Giants in the Meadowlands uh, for a TV station in Philadelphia later. And Marty was there, and I walked up to him and said, hey, thank you so much for making me love the Giants, to love play-by-play, to love broadcasting, and follow myself, my career, and get one. And I stole a lot of your stuff, Marty, early because you were so damn good. And I got to, it felt great to be able to tell him that before he died. What are the types of things that you – stole from him early on that that were so good he was and it's not that it was so good i mean it just it was just his style it's all i knew i never i saw the guys on television but the only radio uh, football broadcast i ever heard was the giants and you have to remember that was the blackout days yeah. well they blacked out every home game including 
including the 58 championship game, the so-called greatest game ever played. And these imbecile NFL owners in New York, you could never get a ticket. They were all sold out and they wouldn't even raise the blackout for the NFL championship game. That's how stupid they were. And this went on forever, as you remember, until suddenly the Redskins later got great with Sonny Jurgensen and all those guys. And the senators and congressmen started saying, hey, about this blackout crap, NFL, listen, if you don't change it, we'll change it for you. And that's when it started to get that, you know, if it's sold out by Thursday, they'll lift the blackout because all those football fans in Congress started saying, oh, no, no, you're not getting away with this. But I listen to Marty all the time, including on that game, lying on the floor of my little apartment in Yonkers, New York, crying my eyes out when Alan Amici scored the touchdown in overtime to win. And, and so Marty was so big with me because he was it for every single home game before that stupid blackout thing was changed. And he would he would talk about uh, takes the snap, drop back, drops back. And a lot of the play by play guys now don't do as much detail as he did. And I think I still do more than most in terms of setting the formation. So and so to the far side, so and so wide receiver near side and set the formation. A lot of these guys just go with the snap and don't really set that except down a distance. But a lot of that was Marty. And he would so you know, he would say. Throws, uh, throws angling to the near side. So I think it gave people a picture of where the ball was. You know, mm-hmm. he's back and throws to the angling to the near side. And a lot of phrases that I don't really use that much now, but I used then. And I thought it was very, he was very descriptive and exciting without screaming and yelling, where you didn't. Uh, uh, and it was a great broadcast. Aldi Regattas, a former Giant offensive tackle, was their uh, color guy. And he was so tight. So tight, I learned later with the coaches that they and they would tell him things about this guy, this tendency, what they plan to do on third and short, third and long. And so Al would go down and say, you know, I think I get a feeling in this case, they might go to the tight end. <laughs> and they would go to the tight end and people thought, my God, you got us as a genius. He's wonderful. And he became so popular in his own right. And Marty was Marty and owned New York doing Knicks and Giants and all that stuff. And uh, they had a hell of a broadcast. They really did. And uh, I was very, very fortunate to be able to learn by listening. So this is where I want to go back to the television side of things because uh, break down the fourth wall here. If you're listening and you haven't heard Ted broadcast before, um, clearly uh, you, you've got an opinion um, that that that's that's good and, and relevant. And I think when you mix that with the the television experience, um, how does that all play into play by play, and particularly in baseball? And storytelling and being analytical and not being afraid to 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 say what you think um, as a play by play guy. Um, how does that all come together to create this kind of cocktail of who you are calling a game? Yeah. And I don't you know, I never like whenever I've planned something, I've screwed it up. Anything that, <laughs> that I've done that worked was just spontaneous and it just happened to work. And that included the TV sports. I'm not sure it was smart to extrapolate that and take that, you know, relaxed delivery with all the opinions and and a a comment, a joke, a story, what have you. If I had to do it over again, I'm not sure I would take that Mm. into play by play, because especially in baseball, very traditional, very traditional owners and managers and and, and general managers and what have you. Because I remember uh, at times when, well, no, not, not at times almost every single ownership that I, that I did that baseball for uh, through, through, for the, for the Padres uh, in the old days, they would, you know, complain and moan and then, you know, are we paying him? (laughs) (laughs) He was just on his talk show talking about collusion. This actually (laughs) happened when, when baseball was caught colluding, remember, and then not signing anybody when Andre Uh Dawson gets a half a million dollar deal and then nobody else gets anything and that sort of thing. And then I was out there, you know, talking about collusion and as it turned out, the owner at the time, uh, Joan Kroc, uh, Ray Kroc, uh, the McDonald's founder, uh, his his wife, and they both bought the Padres, and then Ray had died, and Joan took over, and she called the president of the ball club and said, do we pay him? As he was telling me later, and said, yes. Why? He was just talking about collusion as if I'm involved in the collusion. Well, I, I said, hey, nobody's making an offer, so all the owners must be involved. And you know when you can get away with that, Joel, when the management backs you? If they don't back you and you think you're a tough guy, but if you're packing your bags and getting the moving van, then what good is it? Mm-hmm. And I only got away with it. I only got away with it because I was on television with a big audience and, and people watched a lot of what I was doing. And, and uh, the management of television, like you said, understood not early on, 
and I but later on, they, they understood what was happening, that people like with Howard Stern, the ones that liked him would listen to, you know, 20 percent of the time. And the people that hated him listened 35 percent of the time, that sort of thing, to see what he was going to say. And I ran into that accidentally before even people knew who Howard Stern was. It just happened for me accidentally. And so I think maybe maybe the old Padre ownerships back in the old days, you know, Ray Kroc and Joan Kroc and Tom Werner, who now has the Red Sox, maybe maybe they put up with me because they knew I would beat the crap out of them on television that night. <laughs> if they fired me for the play by play job, I don't know. I don't know. But I wouldn't to save myself aggravation. I would probably have done it with fewer stories and uh, because it's fascinating because Joe Garagiola was was a good friend and Joe. Uh, would say that you know when he was on the NBC Game of the Week, people would complain about telling too many stories, tell them too many stories, just give the score. So when they like you, it's a funny story. When they don't like you, it's shut <laughs> up and give me the score. I don't give a damn, you know that sort of thing. And Joe would get that all the time, and he would say, I don't give a damn, you know. I'm the color guy, and I'm doing stories, and what else? And so maybe, maybe though, I'm not missing a pitch in the middle of the story. It's foul back at a play. It counts zero and two. And as soon as the ball gets in play, I shut up. And do it, but when they don't like you, they perceive it differently. I think at times that you're that you're missing stuff and you're telling stories. And I think the same aggravation way back when in those days, from like 1980 to uh, the early 2000s, I would probably do it more conventionally, just to make it easier on myself. Because you don't need to be, I don't think, that opinionated in uh, in uh, play by play. And both guys are not. And I think they're smarter than I was. I didn't plan to do it that way, but I just kind of took a lot of the TV to the play-by-play, -play, not so much in football, uh, with a different sport, different action, not so much in basketball, but with all the downtime, you know, in baseball, you, you, you've got to go to that stuff, I think. And, and also, and I've told this to owners since then, that, hey, if I did the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Cubs, I wouldn't be telling a story like that. You know what I mean? Because you have the stake. You don't, you don't just sell the sizzle. And so the Padres have been not that good for a long time. So my theory was, hey, if they're down nine to one in the fourth inning, maybe doing it this way, kind of like a talk show slash play by play with stories and what have you, a little bit of humor, hopefully, that maybe we need that because we're not a winning team year to year to year. So I thought there was by accident method to my madness. And I'm sure some executives thought, yeah, and probably others thought no. But again, if I had to do it over again, I, I would not do it that way to save myself aggravation. All that being said, uh, what is the key to good storytelling in a baseball broadcast? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew, I wouldn't, I, as they said, if I knew, I wouldn't be polarizing the audience where, <laughs> you know, they either really love you or they really hate you. And I got that. I got that on, uh, on, on television sports. And I'm sure, you know, Padre fans, I'm sure tell the, in, in the focus groups, they probably tell all the ownerships through the years including this one, that he's, he's always telling stories and shut up and just give the score. And I know that's the reaction to it. <laughs> well, I guess, what, like when, I said, when do you, yeah, I didn't, when, I didn't when do plan you... it, but I, I would do it. I would do it differently. <laughs> my, my favorite one on the, on the polarization, I went to a sure. nightclub and, and, and a, and a uh, the old improv in San Diego, which is no longer there. And a guy, a comedian who was local was doing it and didn't know I was even in the audience. And he said, you know, with the audience research here, if you watch local television news, they've had a new poll that comes out that shows that you either, you either hate Ted Leitner or you are Ted Leitner. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, see, this thing is working and maybe it's not working. Who ever knows it? But it really is becomes it becomes like working without a net. Let me uh, I'll, I'll rephrase that then. Um, uh, like, when do you feel like and and maybe it's not history, but maybe it's, you know, let's say you're let's say you're talking about. Manny's off season during a game this week and what he went through and trying to weave that into a spring training game. Like when do you feel you have told a story well in, in that regard and, and what goes into it for you? That's a damn good question because you really never know, you know, there's no immediate feedback. Yeah. But when I was doing TV, when I was doing TV sports, I would say something and the, and the crew would laugh. You know what I mean? Before the before the days of, of, of automatic cameras that are moving, you know, by, by remote control and, and, and there's nobody out there but a floor person, a floor director. But there's there's most TV stations. There's no cameramen anymore. They just set the camera. They move it remotely and these robotic cameras. But we had guys in Hartford, guys in San Diego, and I would say stuff and I would hear them cracking up. So it was like having a live studio audience. I knew when they when the cameramen and then the floor people would react and laugh that it was good. But I don't know. To answer your question, I don't know. If that was a good story. If your partner laughs, that's a good thing. 
but you really don't know. And there's always going to be, like we talked about, I don't know what the percentage is. There's going to be a percentage. If they don't like you, they're probably not going to think it's funny anyway, probably not going to think it's a good story anyway. And uh, I just occasionally I'll even veer from sports to something else like the military or something like that. And I probably should never do that, I guess, in a baseball broadcast. But, you know, you know, they've done that, that, that research that in a three hour baseball game, the, there's actually action for about 12 minutes mm. out of three hours. So, you know, if you want to do ball one, ball two and be that straight, I think that's fine for a winning team. But I haven't had many winning teams, so I, I think in theory I have a, a smart approach. But I'm sure many people will say in the industry that, no, you know, I don't like them because of that. That's whenever you're different and whenever you're opinionated, you know, the Howard Cosell syndrome, you're going to get that love-hate. And I've always had it in television sports and in the play-by-play, unfortunately. When did they become my Padres and, and your Padres? That was on a television sports when, at, at night whenever – they would lose. I would say, your Padres lost today 4-1. Here are the highlights. Boom. And whenever they won, I call them, hey, my Padres won tonight. And it worked so, again, another accident. It just came out because I was ad-libbing all those TV shows, uh, sportscasts and every place I went. And at that time, my God, I was recognized, according to the research, 90% of the San Diego market knew who I was and what I looked like. So it was interesting out there in public. <laughs> you say something that the Chargers stink or whatever, and then you got to go out there in public the next day. And or go to the ballpark the next day or football practice the next day. So every place I went, I would hear, Ted, and they mine are yours last night. And it, it hooked on so much. And I know the people that listen now, after I've been off television for like 15 years, they have no idea why I say it or what I, I think it's even more stupid than it really is. But that's where it started, where it was always, you know, when they lose their their hours and when they win their Ted's. They're my Padres, he says. And it really became very popular in television. Probably not so much in, in the play by play. Um, let's go beyond storytelling a little bit and, and into the, the 12 minutes of action, uh, beyond, you know, ball strike time score, all that stuff. Uh, what, when you turn on a baseball game that you're listening to, uh, stands out to say, this is, it's not good. This is great. This is, this is what baseball should sound like on radio. Well, in in terms of guys I've listened to. And before I was in the business and after, I thought Jack Buck hung the moon. Jack could tell stories, and he wasn't laughing as he told them. He had the confidence that if it's funny, they'll laugh wherever they are. And a guy told me that in well, Hartford I, one I time. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And a guy told me in Hartford one time when I did something, and I laughed at it on the, on the air. At the same time, Pat Sheehan, the news anchor, and my colleague said, hey, you don't have to laugh at your own stuff. Don't be Mr. Silly. Just and He was older than me, and I, I, I learned from him. And you don't, don't, don't be Mr. Silly, just say it and don't worry about the reaction. You'll get it sometime. You may not get it you know, from the crew. You may not. And that's, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, you just have to do. And uh, if you have that confidence, and I gained that confidence on play-by-play from the success I had in the TV sports where they did research. And that 60%, 60 said the reason they listened to that Channel 8 was because of me to watch and see what the hell I was going to do and say next and all that stuff. And it worked out incredibly well because, I, like I said, I didn't plan it. When I plan it, I screw it up. That's why I've been divorced four times. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I, I maybe took a little bit too much confidence that I could go on the radio broadcast with the baseball and do that same sort of stuff. And like I said early on, I'm sure the owners thought, yeah, we got to put up with him. He's on TV. He'll kill us if we don't keep him employed. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, I'm sure that was part of it. I really, I really believe that, though. They never told me that, and I never asked them uh, that. Uh, I probably would not have done as much of it then or now had I not had that great confidence. But now I've been off television for that longer a period of time, and uh, I don't know that I've cut back on the stories and probably should have but didn't. What's working with a partner like in baseball? Um, and is it different than in football and basketball where it's so much more rapid fire and they just kind of get in, get out, and make their point? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I don't use a color guy in basketball. And tried it because the management said, hey, why don't we have a, a former player? That's the going thing. And he'll know more basketball than you. And I said, I know he will, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we've tried it, and I just I don't know how they do it. 
I really don't know how you do it in a fast-paced game like that, especially with a fast-breaking team. And that's what I've got with San Diego State now, that I tried it, and, I, and the guy would say, what do you want me to do? Do anything you want, but when the ball's in the air, done. You know what I mean? I don't want to have to recreate and, and on radio and, and do this, and they could hear the crowd reacting to a basket. And I'm not saying it because you're still talking. And every guy I had kept talking. And I said, that's it. End of ball game. I'm going to work by myself. And uh, with football, I think it's really important to have a good analyst, a good one. And I've had players and non-players and uh, worked out, I think, with most of them very, very well. And uh, with baseball, I've had great partners who really early on, when I was a football basketball guy, suddenly got the Padre job when Jerry Coleman, the broadcaster, became the manager in 1980. And I was working for the station to carry the games in the same station I was doing TV for, had an AM, and they were doing the Padres, and suddenly, you know, who can we get to replace Jerry? And I said, ooh, ooh, I, I know someone. <laughs> I know I know who you can get. Me! And, uh, well, you're a football basketball guy. When's the last time you did baseball? Campus radio station? Okay, okay, we'll talk to the president of the club and the owner, which was Ray Kroc, and uh, they said yes, and I got the job in 1980, and it was uh, wonderful, simply wonderful, and, uh, and I was so lucky because Jerry was fired after the first year, 80, came back, and he easily could have said, hey, this guy's a big <laughs> shot on television. Yeah. We don't need him in here. We don't need him in here. And Jerry kept me, and then we worked side by side for 35 years, and God bless him, and, and I, I owe him so much and had so much fun with him. And as a man, this was uh, beyond my father. I mean, this guy was friend, brother, uncle, father, role model, everything is this Marine fighter pilot and war hero, former Yankee second baseman who I'd watched on television in New York as a kid. And now I'm pitching myself because here I am doing play by play with him and co color work with him. And he's introducing me to, you know, Yogi Berra and, and Mickey Mantle and the whole list of all those Yankees that Jerry played with. And I'm thinking, what have I done to deserve all this? This is unbelievable. And I've always thought that if the money's good, and the work is so wonderful, but the idea of because you're in this business meeting so many incredible, interesting people, your heroes when you were a kid, and it's just great. And it's not name dropping. It's just that same old, how did I get here? How am I sitting here, you know, sitting and talking to John Glenn, which happened, you know, the astronaut and Wally Shira, the original Mercury 7 astronaut with John Glenn, who lived in Rancho Santa Fe, fairly near me. And I'm sitting at lunch with guys like this, listening to their stories and thinking, what a great part of the business to meet these people. It's just wonderful, wonderful. At the beginning of that, I, I'll, on the flip side of that, I don't know how people do basketball without an analyst. It's, I, 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 like, I admire you to no end on that note. Um, I did a game solo because my analyst was out of town a, a week ago, and it's just one of those things like I, you can't see any – like I, how you're able to see everything else that's going on um, beyond just what's on the ball is always the thing that, that amazes me, to be able to analyze the bigger picture. And again, I, I know enough basketball that I can give them some analysis work. And I'm in the film room with the, with the players yeah. I, I, in the pregame meal. Uh, Coach Dutcher as, and Steve Fisher before that would say, hey, you can come in anytime. You're on the bus with us. You're one of us. You're traveling with us. And you know what's off the record and what's not. And we trust you that way. You do be smart enough to know that. And so I'm watching. I know what they're going to do. I know what they're planning to do. Are they going to double in the post? Are they going to switch? Are they going to you know, go in the zone? I know exactly what they're planning and why. So I can use enough, just enough of that, I think, to get in there with analysis type work to blend in without having, you know, in a fast break, having the guy talking and suddenly I'm playing catch up and a recreation, like I mentioned. And it's worked out extremely well, I, I think, to this point. I'm sure there's other stuff that I miss. That they're, that they're doing from a strategy standpoint that I might miss when I'm watching the play-by-play. -play. But uh, it just, uh, it's a great sport, great sport. And like you said, much different than baseball. It's moving, just like in football. The ball snapped and 22 people are running all over the place. And uh, that'll test you big time. So uh, I solicited questions from Twitter when, uh, when I uh, found out we were going to be doing this as well. And I wanted yeah. to ask you about um, a guy that you worked with with the Padres, um, he was on television, uh, but somebody wanted to know uh, your relationship with Dick Enberg and if you have any good stories uh, from your time together covering the team um, in San Diego. I tell you what, great question, because there was a guy that writes a, 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 a blog, wherever he does. I forget his name, 
but I see it all the time. And he did a piece saying, you know, uh, Ted Leitner, who was, you know, kind of crazy and wacko and whatever, uh, and, and Dick Enberg doing the Padres on television is a straight middle of the road guy with none of that stuff. It, it's amazing <laughs> to me that they, amazing to me that they get along. And I thought, how stupid is that comment that Dick and I have been friends way before he became the Padre guy because he's lived in La Jolla uh, in, in forever in, in the San Diego area. And he was working NBC and then uh, CBS doing NFL and Wimbledon for ESPN and so forth. And so I'd known Dick and then had a wonderful time with him. I'll tell you what, when they signed Dick Enberg, I wrote a letter to the then CEO saying, hey, what a great hire. I'm honored just to be in the same press box with him, let alone now getting to know him and traveling with him and so forth. And I would sit next to Dick on the bus on the plane and we'd talk and tell stories. He was a wonderful, wonderful man with a body of work. I told his, his widow, Barbara, at the Hall of Fame during the induction for Trevor Hoffman last summer. Bob, 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 Barbara was there because Dick, of course, won the Ford Frick a couple of years ago into the broadcast wing of the Hall of Fame. So Barbara was there. And I said to Barbara, my God, in my wildest dreams, I could never think about doing the body of work that Professor Enberg has done. And, and I miss him so much. And I do. So the guy questioning how we can get along because we have different styles was just absurd. Just absurd. We... It was, I mean, because every, every big thing, what do you do, like 46 years of NFL and how many Super Bowls and Wimbledon and all that stuff, those are the big guys. You know, those, those, those guys, through the years, I, I'm not even in the same zip code. Not even, I don't even think it, nor should anybody else. So to even know guys like that is an honor to me, and that includes Vin Scully, and it certainly in, included Mel Allen and it includes Dick Enberg. And it, it broke my heart that, you know, he retired and, you know, suddenly gone, just like that. And uh, it, it's really hard to get over, really hard to get over. And to answer your question, there, there were so many stories. There was never really one that, you know, that I, I really grab onto that I remember that much. But, uh, my God, what, what? This was a college, a, a professor, a, a, a teacher. He got his doctorate. He's going to be a teacher. And that incredible, mellifluous voice, he started doing some stuff in college, just like I did. And became Dick Enberg. Just absolutely incredible. Well, like I said, this business, meeting your idols, as well as in other areas, is just a, it's a great blessing. You know, while you're mentioning some of those other names, too, like what, what's it like to be a baseball announcer in, at the major league level and, and that fraternity? Um, you know, I think back to, you know, when I was doing minor league baseball and you're on the road with guys in A ball and just the, the mm-hmm. camaraderie you have. Um, what's the camaraderie like at the major league level? And when you, you roll into Los Angeles and you, you see Vin or you go to New York and you, you, you see, you know, John and, and Susan or wh- wherever you are, just mm-hmm. the, the people that have, what people have seen and the experiences they all have and how you guys share that amongst each other. It's again, just another adjunct to what we said, money's good, despite the travel, whatever. And you're in a ballpark. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. I remember Marv Levy, when he had the Buffalo Bills, used to walk up and down the line when they were working out, you know, stretching before a ball game. And he'd say to John, Bill, Mac, John, hey, where else would you, hey, John, where else would you rather be at 1 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon? Look at, look around. You're in an NFL stadium. And I've always felt that way when I did the National Football League with the Chargers and I did NBA way back in the 80s. I've always thought, what's this kid doing in the National Football League in the broadcast booth? I used to walk around Yankee Stadium. The original, original Yankee Stadium was a vendor when I was in high school. And I'd be torn between looking at the field. And this was Mantle and Maris and Delson Howard and Whitey Ford and all these guys. <laughs> and looking at the field. Or looking up at the press box and looking at Mel Allen and looking at Red Barber and, and Joe Garagiola and those guys doing the broadcast and uh, and, and Jerry Coleman. And then the one year he did the Yankees also after he retired. And I was just, my God, it was just, and suddenly I'm with these people. I know these people. And like I said, in meeting these celebrities and, and your, your childhood heroes, it's such a great part, great part of our business. And, and with all the players I've gotten to know, from Tony Gwynn to Steve Garvey, and, and all these others through the years, and, and uh, Jake Peavy, you know, and g- guys going to the Hall of Fame, some that are in the Hall of Fame. I was, I was standing at a press box in Montreal and uh, back in, in the in early 80s, and I hear, Ted! And I turn around, and it's Duke Snyder. Unknowns to me, Duke at the time lived in Fallbrook, right outside in the countryside, outside San Diego. And the Duke of Flatbush is coming up to me, knows my name, 
and shaking my hand, telling me he watches me every night. I'm thinking, okay, wake, wake me. Go ahead. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming here. Wake me. And that sort of stuff happened a lot. And it's just, I'm sorry. If you, if you have those things happen and the great Duke Snyder knows your name and, 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 and that, and you don't get excited to get goosebumps, get out of the business. Get out of the business because you're, you're, it's not because of you or anything you've done. It's just that you happen to be their local TV guy or what have you. And it's been absolutely a thrill, just a thrill. I, I wish my parents had been alive. And that happened when uh, Jerry Coleman uh, knew uh, Jerry Lewis, who also would leave Las Vegas in the heat of the summer and live on his boat in San Diego. So uh, uh, he had, unbeknownst to me, Jerry had called and wanted to come to the game and asked if he could sit in the press box. So unbeknownst to me, Jerry, in watching television on his boat, would watch me do the sports. I didn't know him. He was one of my absolute all-time favorite entertainers. No one made me laugh more as a kid. So I walk in the booth that night, and Jerry Coleman, my partner, is not there, but Jerry Lewis is there. And I walk in, I stop, and he says, Ted Leitner, oh, you're an ornery guy. You're so, oh, you put a, what a big mouth. And he goes on and on and on. I watch you all the time. You're so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, Mom, Dad, how I wish you were here. Jerry Lewis even knows I'm alive. This is so great. <laughs> and he would. He became a good friend and would come up and sit with us all the time and uh, had him on the air, which was a big mistake during the game. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was bouncing off the walls and he would say, watch, watch this. And the Lowe's was right below in, in the old stadium, right below the press box. He'd say, watch this. Stanley, Stanley. And you know, like nine people would turn around. Had to be that many Stanleys or whatever name you picked. He said, it works every time. Works every time. Meanwhile, the ball's bouncing in the left center field gap. It's going <laughs> off the wall. And Jerry is just uncontrollable, going crazy. I love this. I want a hot dog with mustard. <laughs> and I'm saying, okay, mental note. Have him on your talk show, but don't bring him on the broadcast on the game anymore. <laughs> that's uh... – it's. I just got done watching Mrs. Maisel last week, so like all I can see is now like that's the envision I have in my mind of that playing out modern day. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Ted, if people want to find you on social media, or if they want to catch you uh, broadcasting, um, how do they track you down? They, the MLB dot com has the uh, the, uh, the MLB at bat app has the radio broadcast, and I don't know. I don't know all the. the rules and what they do in terms of the visiting broadcast or broadcasters or versus the home broadcasters, how they do all that. But I'm sure they'll explain that. And I'm, I'm an at Ted Leitner on Twitter. I'm not a Facebook guy. And I, I just, uh, uh, Twitter's fine enough for me. And that's, uh, and again, where the broadcasts are at MLB.com or Padres.com. And that's us. And that's our broadcast. And I'll tell you what, it, I've, I've had a lot of losing season, like I said, but this young group is the greatest group of talent in Padre history. And uh, I don't know if the pitching is there. It's not there yet, but signing Manny Machado has energized this fan base so mm. wonderfully that I'm doing exhibition games. I'm having fun already. And Manny hadn't even played an exhibition game yet. And uh, this is an amazing group of talent because the ownership has put $100 million into international signings in the free agent draft, gave Eric Hosmer $144 million last year, and now giving Manny $300 million. And they are committed to winning like no ownership in Padre history. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. People were like, why is Manny in San Diego? And I was like, clearly you all have never been to San Diego before. Like... Good point. And Manny <laughs> said that. Manny was amazed. When, and Manny was amazed. And, and saying that, he, hearing that, he, he told uh, USA Today Weekly, a sports supplement, he said, hey, it was San Diego all the way. It was, it was never. I was never. The White Sox were upset. They thought he was coming. I never said I'm coming to Chicago. He said, I've been in San Diego. I'm not stupid. Who, who, do, who, doesn't, who doesn't want to live in San Diego? And he also knows our, our, most of our young talent is Latino from the Dominican and Venezuela. Like it's never been in Padre history. He feels so comfortable around all these guys. I, I sat with Manny for 10 minutes around the cage. Uh, when the other guys were taking batting practice yesterday, and it's like a magnet to the Latino and the, in the Anglo players. I mean, he is Manny Machado, and they come to him like it's a magnet, and they want to pick his brain about hitting and playing the field and, and being a teammate and all that stuff. And, uh, I mean, he has, he's so happy, and the team is just jazzed that he's here. Well, Ted, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I am endlessly appreciative. Um, looking forward to uh, having you uh, – follow those Padres all season long and, and seeing where that thing develops and uh, glad we could sit down and chat and, uh, and, and glad you're healthy and everything is, uh, is going well with you as well.
I appreciate that very much. I was scared to death last summer because I thought I had, they told me I had kidney cancer and I went to the lab after they took out the kidney and they called and said the greatest word you'll ever hear mm. benign. Mm. So, Hey, winning, losing all that stuff is gravy. This business of uh, not, not losing that oxygen habit. That's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. Great thing. And I've enjoyed it, Joel, every single second. Guys, that is Ted Leitner joining us here on Play by Playcast. Uh, he gave you his social media handle there at the end of it. Uh, make sure you hit him up on Twitter and show him some love. Let him know that you heard the podcast and uh, learned a thing or two from it. Uh, always appreciative when uh, you let the guests know that you listened uh, so that they know that somebody was listening and it wasn't just them and myself conversing on the phone for an hour for no apparent reason. So that would be great. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, couple of guests uh, already in the can for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I mentioned the, the wild schedule I've got coming up. So uh, next week, Carl Ravitch will be with us. ESPN play-by-play -play announcer. We'll talk a ton of baseball. Uh, so Carl Ravitch gets us in that spring mood. And then uh, Rich Waltz, former television voice of the Florida Marlins, now with CBS Sports Network. Um, he's been with CBS Sports Network for a while, MLB Network. Uh, he will be on the week after that. Uh, thanks, as always, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next Friday here on PXP. See you. And that will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.